Jennifer vanished sometime in the overnight hours. Right now, there is no trace. Investigators say evidence leads them to believe that she's dead. Stick my nose back on the trail. That's all I can do. This is already gone. Already gone. Already gone. Nyla Franklin was destined for good things. She was hardworking and ambitious. She came from a loving family of high achievers. Parents and siblings and step-siblings who wanted success for themselves and for others. She grew up with siblings and step-siblings, and the family was both close-knit and affectionate. Her sisters sometimes went to her for advice, but only if they actually wanted to hear it, because Nyla would give it to them straight. Nyla went to the University of Illinois and studied advertising, but ended up working in pharmaceutical sales. She had a job with Eli Lilly in Chicago. In the mid-aughts, Nyla is in her late 20s. She's single, smart, successful, living in a condo she bought in downtown Chicago. And she liked to date men who were like her, hardworking, successful men. She was picky. But because she moved in professional circles, she was exposed to the type of men she wanted to date, fellow young success stories. And given her preference for high-achieving men, it's funny that she met one of her boyfriends, Reginald Potts, literally on the street in May of 2006. They were in a wealthy part of Chicago, the Gold Coast, and he was driving a luxury car, making Reginald the type of guy Nyla would be interested in. He told her that he was a real estate investor and that he lived in a high-rise with a view of Lake Michigan. While Reginald seemed like the perfect catch, their relationship never went anywhere. They both dated other people during the year that they saw each other off and on, and the relationship was more casual than it was serious. At some point, a few months after meeting Reginald, Nyla decided she was seeing too many red flags. One of her friends was a criminal attorney who ran a background check on him for Nyla. This background check, it revealed that Reginald wasn't a studied hard in school, then built a career type of guy. In fact, Reginald Potts was two years out of prison. He had several felony convictions on his record. His adult record began when he was 19. In the spring of 96, he was arrested for having, on multiple occasions, stolen cars from dealerships in Cook County, Illinois. After he bonded out, he stole the car back from the police impound by posing as a courier. While an employee was busy looking for some paperwork, Reginald took off with the vehicle. Another version of what happened, and this is the one that Reginald preferred to share when people asked about his background, was that he was working at a car dealership and, with a few other guys, they decided to take some of the cars for a joyride. He took the rap for all of the cars taken. See? He's a good guy. He just made a mistake. We have two very different versions of events, one being told by the state's attorney's office and then what Reginald told people. He was given a seven-year sentence for theft, and after he was released, he was on parole in the spring of 2001 when he was caught with another stolen vehicle. In June of 2001, Reginald told a Highland Park detective that he was going to blow the officer's brains out and then go after his family. Reginald said the detective's family would never be safe and he would feel the end of Reginald's 45. Listeners, these are not normal comments made by a normal person. The feds took Reginald into custody for intimidation, but when the FBI left him handcuffed to a bench unsupervised, he managed to slip out of the cuffs and run. He was caught two weeks later. Reginald also had physical altercations with law enforcement, although he said it was only in response to mistreatment by police. He also had misdemeanor convictions for theft and assault. Last but not least, his ex-wife, the mother of his children, she had a restraining order against him. Reginald used aliases and fake social security numbers a few times when he was arrested, but at the time Nyla met him, he was using his real name and appeared to be running a successful investing business. Despite his extensive criminal history, Nyla didn't immediately break things off. But his stories didn't add up. She eventually found out that another girlfriend of his was either pregnant or had just had a baby. He denied that the baby belonged to him, which was a lie. 
Milo wrote Reginald an email in mid-July of 2007. The subject line of the email: "Adios." In the email, she said the relationship was over for good. She accused him of denying his child, lying about his past, and flirting with her friends. Nyla was done. She wanted to move on. It was about the same time that she sent this email that she met another man, Andre Wright. They met at an art gallery. Andre was a lawyer from Milwaukee. He and Nyla hit it off right away and began a long-distance relationship using texts and calls to stay in touch, with trips to visit each other on the weekends. Nyla's family liked Andre. They found him intelligent, kind, and thoughtful. Some of their perception of Andre surely came from Nyla, who was thinking of settling down. The two discussed living together in September after just 3 months of dating. On the 29th of August, when 28-year-old Nyla was still not 100% sure where things were going with Andre, she called her coworker Tiffany to wish her a happy birthday. While they were chatting, Nyla mentioned being mad at herself for having quote hooked up with Reginald Potts just the day before. Tiffany said, "Hey, you've got a good thing with Andre. Don't throw it away for Reginald." "Oh, and by the way, Reginald is now dating one of our friends, a woman named Joy." An hour after this phone call, Tiffany's phone rang. It was Reginald. He asked her what she said to Nyla about him. He said that Nyla called him confronting him about dating Joy. Tiffany told him that all she meant was that they both had other people in their lives and they were both moving on. And while she'd stated in the email that she wanted Reginald out of her life, Nyla didn't let it go. Instead, she emailed several of their mutual friends to expose him. Some people considered this email one of revenge, and some viewed it as a "heads up, this guy is a creep" type warning. In the email, Nyla wrote what she knew about Reginald's criminal past. She knew about the kids with his ex-wife and his new baby with another girlfriend, and this is where she made a terrible mistake. She didn't just send out an email to their friends. She CC'd Reginald on the email. And not surprisingly, he was furious. He responded to the email, attaching a link to an article about his escape, which makes it almost sound like he didn't care if people knew. But it's obvious that he did care because the email can best be described as profanity-laced. He also threatened to share a sex tape of him with Nyla. Reginald contacted her friends because Nyla's response asked him to stop contacting her friends. She said she knew he was trying to hurt her, but she'd moved on. Then she said she was sorry he wanted more, but she couldn't give it to him. She told him that she wished him the best and that she had no hard feelings. But the emails continued, and Reginald was also calling Nyla. In a call from September 6th, the day she sent the email, Reginald told her that she was coming across as bitter, and he reminded her that he was very wealthy and he would always have his choice of women. In the voicemail, his voice is so even, he doesn't even sound angry, but Reginald was definitely angry. He's boosting himself and putting her down for about 3 straight minutes, repeating himself multiple times in an attempt to make it sound like he didn't care, but he very obviously cared. Why keep contacting her otherwise? There were more calls including one where Nyla played the voicemail for her friends. So we have witnesses to what Reginald said. In this call, Reginald said he was going to have her erased. Nyla took this threat seriously enough that on September 10th, she dialed 311, which is the city services number and is used for non-emergency police issues. You would call 311 for the police when you didn't need to call 911. Nyla told the dispatcher that she had an ex-boyfriend who was threatening her. She said the man, Reginald Potts, had been violent with other people in the past, but never violent with her. The dispatcher gave her information on how to get an order of protection, and they took down a report about the harassment. Nyla then emailed Reginald. She told him that she filed a report and was going to get a protection order against him. She said he wasn't going to threaten her with a sex tape because she could have him locked up for it since he stole it from her house. She also said he messed with the wrong person. Nyla wasn't going to put up with his lies and his threats. Growing up, she was always straight with her sisters and she was straight with Reginald Potts. She'd had enough. And listeners, we'll be right back. 
Is something preventing you from reaching your goals? Is something interfering with your happiness? BetterHelp Online Counseling is there for you. I should know. I used BetterHelp when my father was terminally ill. I worked with a counselor to deal with my grief, anxiety, and anger issues. You can schedule weekly phone or video sessions. And best of all, you can message your counselor at any time. Whether you need help with depression, stress, family conflict, LGBTQ matters, or unresolved trauma, convenient, professional, affordable help is within reach. Visit BetterHelp.com slash gone and use code gone for a special savings on your first month with a licensed professional counselor. Your sessions are confidential. That's BetterHelp.com slash gone. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health at BetterHelp. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash gone. Why wait? Start feeling better today with BetterHelp. When we left off, Nyla Franklin of Chicago was in the middle of a nasty split from her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Reginald Potts. She'd called the police to find out about getting a restraining order. But when September 11th came around... Nyla did not get the order of protection. A detective called her to follow up on her 311 call, and she told him she planned to get the order, but in the end, she didn't get it. What Nyla did was give her friend Dana the passwords to her email account and to her voicemail. Nyla told Dana that if anything happened, to give the passwords to the police so they could see the emails and hear the threatening voicemails from Reginald. On the morning of Tuesday, September 18th, 2007, Nyla called her boyfriend, Andre Wright, and everything seemed normal. They texted and emailed during the day. Then, on his way home from work that night, Andre called her. It was about 8.15. But Nyla didn't answer. She texted him that she was at dinner and would call later. Around 9 p.m., her sister, Ashley, called and got the same thing. No answer, and then a text saying that she'd call after dinner. And this struck her as odd, because Nyla was the type who would answer the phone if a family member called, even if she was in the middle of something else. But Nyla did not call Andre or Ashley back. The next morning, September 19th, Andre tried again to call her and email, but he didn't get any response. So he sent her an email in all caps saying, Are you alive? Obviously, he meant this in a lighthearted way, basically saying, I'm a little worried, please check in. But he received no response. Then, Nyla's sister Leah got a call from Nyla's boss. She hadn't shown up to work and missed a very important meeting. That is something Nyla would never do. So they wanted to touch base with family. Leah tried to call Nyla and got no answer. She called their family members to see when the last time was that anyone had spoken with her. But no one had heard from Nyla since at least the day before, so Leah went to her condo. She didn't get an answer when she knocked, so she let herself in. Nyla's eggs and coffee were sitting there, not cleaned up, but Leah couldn't know if it was from that morning or the day before. I think she assumed it was from that morning, but the truth is that no one appeared to have talked to Nyla since midday the day before. Her only communication was via text. Leah reported Nyla missing, and the police took the case seriously, but Leah worked in public relations, and she knew the media might not take it seriously. She knew that she wouldn't find her sister without media coverage, and she knew she was less likely to get that media coverage because Nyla was a black woman living in an urban area. And yeah, we're going to go there. Black women are 2.4 times more likely than white women to be the victims of homicide in the U.S., Yet media coverage of the cases would make you think those numbers were inverse. So listeners, Leah didn't expect the media to jump on the story of a missing black woman from the middle of an urban area without a little nudge. She called her media contacts and she pushed to get coverage, and the next morning, Nyla's case was all over the news. Police got a search warrant for Nyla's condo. Everything looked normal except her two laptops, the work laptop and the personal laptop as well as her cell phone, were missing. When they checked the garage looking for her black Chevy Impala, it wasn't there. Investigators asked the building for security footage, and they were given a few tapes. Meanwhile, they're also pulling Nyla's phone records, which we're going to get to. 
From the start, there were two people police really wanted to talk to, current boyfriend Andre and former boyfriend Reginald. They talked to Andre right away. As soon as he found out that Nyla was missing, he went to Chicago to be with her family and see how he could help. He said he last saw Nyla that past weekend when they attended a wedding in Milwaukee. She went back to Chicago on Sunday. He explained that he had trouble getting in touch with her Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, so he sent that half-joking, are you alive message. Police asked about his alibi, and he was able to prove that he was in Milwaukee the whole time. He only returned to Chicago once Nyla was missing. Before police could contact Reginald Potts, he reached out to them on September 21st, the same day her car was found. He volunteered to come to the police station. He seemed open and ready to speak to police, but he claimed he and Nyla weren't in touch, and he downplayed their relationship. The police asked him about the police report, and he admitted there was a heated exchange. But he was trying to get Nyla to stop calling him, not the other way around. He told them he broke things off with her, even though the emails indicated Nyla was the one who dumped him. Police knew that Reginald had been harassing Nyla, and she was concerned. But he did have an alibi for most of the day. He said that he went to Target with his friend Eccles and then went out with a few women separately that evening. He got back to his apartment around 11.30, give or take, and he met up with another woman who stayed the night. He provided contact information for all of them, and they all confirmed Reginald was where he said he was. It looked like police were back at square one, but Nyla's phone records came in, and they were a gold mine of information. They showed that Nyla was a prolific caller and texter, but on September 18th, there was sporadic usage after about one o'clock with some big gaps. Around 1.30 on September 18th, Nyla called her voicemail and was on the line for six and a half minutes. Then just before two, a coworker called and the call lasted less than a minute. This looks like it was a voicemail being left rather than a conversation with Nyla. Then there were two hours with zero activity and Nyla called her voicemail again around 4 p.m. Then exactly two more hours of no activity, and at 6 p.m. she again checked her voicemail. After the 6 p.m. voicemail check, Nyla texted a friend, Brent, just saying, hey. Then 10 minutes later, her phone called a restaurant. Based on pings, the two calls were on towers 10 minutes apart, giving police the impression that she was driving in that direction, which would be southeast. Except the person who made the reservation from Nyla's phone was not her. It was a man's voice making a reservation for four people for 8.30 p.m. under the name Something Franklin. The person taking the reservation couldn't understand the first name clearly, though he was under the impression it was a woman's name, so he just wrote down Franklin. Then, around 7.30, Nyla called her friend Brent. It's a 19-second call, and the connection was pretty bad and staticky. He heard what sounded like Nyla say, can you hear me, before hanging up and complaining that her phone wasn't working. She may have said something about going to dinner either on this call or on a second call that was similar, with terrible static and a bad connection. The call was so bad, the call quality was so bad, that he wasn't sure it was even her on the phone, but he assumed that it was. Nyla then texted him that her phone wasn't working. And then she said she would call after her dinner. He was in the middle of something, so he didn't reply, and Nyla texted, you could at least respond, about five minutes later. At this point, Nyla's phone is pinging off a tower in Lansing, Illinois, which is 30 minutes south of Chicago and located along the Illinois-Indiana state line. At 7.40, Brent tried to call Nyla and got her voicemail. A minute later, she texted that she was at dinner. After that, Brent tried to call her again, and this time her phone is pinging in Calumet City, which is between Lansing and Chicago. Nyla called her voicemail at 747, and this will be the last time she calls her voicemail. What's notable is that this call lasted only 44 seconds, whereas her previous calls to voicemail lasted over six minutes. Between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m., a few calls came in, but Nyla never answered. Then, at 10.14 p.m., a 911 call is made from Nyla's phone. The call lasted 13 seconds, and the 911 recording just had soft music in the background. No voices, no yelling, no screaming, no sounds of a struggle. 
The phone was back in Chicago at this point, in the South Loop area. Then the caller hung up. The dispatcher called back, and the phone was answered, but again, silence. After four seconds, the caller hung up. Moments later, Nyla's phone called 911 again, and the call lasted 18 seconds, and the caller hung up. The dispatcher called back, the phone was answered, but there was more silence. 22 seconds later, the caller hung up. So dispatch called back, and the same thing happened after just a few seconds. Then at 10.16, another call is placed to 911 from Nyla's phone. 13 seconds of silence and the caller hung up. The dispatcher called back, and you know what happens next. So, three calls from Nyla's phone to 911, and four attempts by the dispatcher to call back. Let's trace out the travels of her phone. First, the phone is in Chicago. Then it goes south to Lansing, Illinois. Then it travels north again, pinging in Calumet City, and then it's back in Chicago. These records almost make it seem like Nyla was out with someone, they went south to Lansing for some reason, and then came back to Chicago. And that whatever happened to her must have occurred around 10.15 when the 911 call started. But listeners, things aren't always as they appear. Police started to wonder if the activity on Nyla's phone wasn't her. None of it made sense. It seemed more likely that someone would have used her phone to fake activity. And we know of plenty of cases where that's happened. Is Nyla fighting for her life and dialing 911 for help? No one can reach her, and she's not responding to calls from the emergency dispatcher. Meanwhile, police in Chicago are looking for Nyla, and thanks to her sister, Leah, Nyla's case was featured on the news. So Officer Calvin Lucius was aware of her case when he was out on patrol, and he spotted something unusual on his rounds. There were six boxes stacked on a curb in the parking lot of a golf course. He went to check them out, and they were full of medication samples. Thinking a doctor's office had been robbed, he took them into evidence. That's when he noticed the label on one of the boxes said Nyla Franklin. He knew she was missing. He and Nyla, they didn't really know each other, but they had a lot of mutual friends because they grew up in the same area. So he placed a call to Chicago police, and they came down to search. They searched the area on foot and even searched a lagoon near the parking lot that was surrounded by trees. They sent divers into the water and dredged the bottom, but they found no sign of Nyla in the water. But in the trees and bushes around the water, they found some women's jewelry strewn about like someone had thrown it. When they showed the pieces to Nyla's friends and family, they said it was consistent with the stuff that Nyla owned. It seems unlikely that Nyla would have discarded her jewelry randomly, and it's looking less and less likely that she was the one texting people that night. Another big break came when Nyla's car was found in Hammond, Indiana. Now, you didn't hear Hammond as a city on the cell phone pings, but it is just over the border from Lansing, so it's consistent with her phone's travels. A man who saw the media coverage that Leah had pushed for called it in. He realized the missing Chevy on the news reports was the same black Chevy parked on his street for days. It was sitting in front of an abandoned house. Investigators gathered, and they held their breath when they popped the trunk of the car, but there was no body in it. A search of the house and neighborhood didn't turn up any significant clues, except that someone saw a slim black man standing by the car, and that another car came by and picked him up. The car itself, her black Chevy, had such a lack of evidence, there weren't even any fingerprints. Evidence technicians believed that the car was purposely wiped down, and the reports of a slim black man... Well, that description fit both Andre and Reginald. The evidence is telling investigators that the path from Chicago to Calumet City to Hammond is key to finding Nyla, and they concentrated their searches in spots off the highway in these areas. Police departments knew to keep an eye out as they were out patrolling, and that is how they found Nyla's body. On September 27th, eight days after Nyla was reported missing, Officer Lucius was patrolling Calumet City with his partner. They knew they should be looking out for anything that stood out as odd in their search for Nyla. Remember, Officer Lucius was the one who found the medications on patrol, so it just seems crazy that he would be there when Nyla's body was found. The pair were going by a vacant video store around four in the morning when a set of earbuds stuck in a tree caught the eye of his partner. 
That's when he noticed that the tall grass along the edge of the parking lot had one section that had been flattened, like someone had gone back there. It led right into the woods. Using their flashlights, they only made it about five or six steps along this flattened grass path when they saw the partially buried and badly decomposed body of a nude woman. She was unrecognizable, but of course, Nyla was who they first thought it could be, especially since the abandoned medication was found just a mile away. The next day, dental records confirmed her identity. An autopsy wouldn't be able to determine the cause of death immediately. Nyla's body had no broken bones and no broken hyoid bone to indicate strangulation. The tox screen on her remains came back clear. Months later, her death was ruled a homicide by asphyxiation and police believe that Nyla was strangled to death. The hyoid bone being intact didn't rule it out since it only breaks in about one-third of cases. Meanwhile, Reginald Potts is calling detectives to find out what was going on with the case and also making sure they talk to all of his alibi witnesses. He wanted to be clear of any suspicion. And just like Reginald wanted, the police ran down his alibi. Even with his night accounted for, he was a solid suspect. He had violent altercations in his background, and Nyla filed a police report because of his harassing behavior. That seemed significant since the killer had taken the laptops and the cell phone, the places where Nyla's proof of Reginald's harassment would be easily found. Obviously, email can be logged onto the web from anywhere, so this wasn't an issue. And police confirmed that Reginald, no matter how not mad he claimed to be, did seem pretty upset in those emails. But when it came to the voicemails, like the voicemail where Reginald threatened to erase Nyla, the one she shared with friends, the voicemail wasn't there. It must have been deleted. Nyla was saving her voicemails from Reginald, but someone accessed her voicemail after police believed Nyla was dead, and it would have been easy enough to erase them at that point. With the emails, though, police did find one that backed up Reginald's claim that the two weren't on bad terms. It was sent from Nyla to Reginald on the day she went missing. It's hard to say what the time was because it's not clear where they took this from, and that could affect the timestamp. I think it's in Pacific time, which would put it around 5 p.m., but if it's in local time, it was sent at 3 p.m. Anyway, this email has Nyla apologizing to Reginald, saying she was hurt and shouldn't have retaliated. She thanked him for not being mad and hoped that the two could be friends one day. I have a hard time believing that Nyla sent this email, especially since Reginald was absolutely angry with her, and that was easy enough to prove with the previous emails. It fit the narrative Reginald pushed, which made it all the more suspicious. But back to Reginald's alibi... It just didn't hold up. Police are looking at the time frame from 7 to 10.30 p.m. when Nyla's phone was on the move. Reginald's friend Eccles told police that he and Reginald were at Target together at 7 p.m. So police pulled security footage. They followed Eccles through the store using Target's closed-circuit TV system. Reginald was not in a single frame of the footage. If Reginald was there, he hid from Target's cameras and listeners. That seems unlikely. After seeing the tapes, police pulled Eccles in and he finally admitted he lied because Reginald asked him to lie. Not only that, he'd gotten a call from Reginald on the night Nyla went missing. He said he was stranded in Hammond, Indiana and needed a ride home. Hammond being, of course, where Nyla's car was dumped. Eccles picked him up and then said he dropped Reginald off in the South Loop around 10 p.m. Of course, this is around the time Nyla's phone started calling 911 from the same area. Police also pulled security tapes from Nyla's building, not just the day she went missing, but the day before as well, because neighbors reported seeing an unknown man lurking around the stairwell. It was about 9.45 at night on the 17th when a man who resembled Reginald was seen coming off the garage entry elevator in Nyla's building. Security was called and they asked this man who he was. He said he was a resident and gave a fake name. The security guard called police, but the man left before they arrived. Later, tape was found on the garage door, preventing it from shutting and automatically locking. Now, we can't say with 100% certainty that this was Reginald. The ID was not certain. At 11.49 the next morning, which is the day she disappeared, 
Nyla was seen going out of the parking garage wearing a white long sleeve dress shirt, black pants, dark shoes, and carrying two bags. At 12.29, which is 40 minutes later, Nyla is seen entering the building through the garage doorway and getting onto an elevator. There's a man with her, and he resembles Reginald Potts. As she's walking into the building, she looks like she has a phone to her ear. Reginald, or rather the man that looks like Reginald, also has a phone to his ear. At 1.10, the two are seen getting off another elevator near the parking garage. This is the last time Nyla was seen. At 4.22 p.m., only Reginald is seen getting off an elevator near the garage. Police also pulled footage from Reginald's building, and they spotted him wearing what the man in the footage from Nyla's apartment was wearing, only further cementing it in their minds that this was Reginald Potts with Nyla, making him the last person to see her alive. So we have Reginald lying about his alibi and lying about the last time he saw Nyla, as well as lying about his communications with her and he asked a friend to pick him up near where Nyla's car was abandoned. He's working really hard to look innocent, and all it's doing is making him look more and more guilty. Listeners, we'll be right back. The Fall Line is a deep-dive true crime podcast focused on missing people, unsolved homicides, and unidentified persons whose cases have gotten little, if any, media attention. We've covered the victims of serial killer Samuel Little and the forgotten Atlanta Lover's Lane murders, unsolved cold cases like the murder of 12-year-old Georgia Moses and unidentified John and Jane Doe's. The Fall Line digs deep into cases, interviewing experts like forensic anthropologists, genetic genealogists, DNA experts, and investigators closest to the crimes. Through narrative storytelling, primary and archival research, and expert and family interviews, The Fall Line introduces listeners to victims and survivors they've never heard of and explores why their cases never made it to prime time. Look for new releases from The Fall Line on Wednesdays, wherever you get your podcasts. When we left off, Reginald was last seen on his apartment security camera for the last time around 6 p.m., which is the last time Nyla's phone pinged in the Chicago area. He came back to the high-rise around 10.30 p.m., and we know Nyla's phone was back in Chicago at this time as well. The time in between these two points, between 6 and 10.30, as Nyla's phone was pinging off towers, so was Reginald's. On the evening of September 18th, those phones were together. Reginald's phone went down to the Lansing area and back up through Calumet City, just like Nyla's. Police went to Reginald's apartment to talk with him again, and they found his front door damaged. They later learned that he had to be evicted by force, and his high-rent apartment was bare bones. He didn't even have a bed frame. He slept on a mattress on the floor. They later learned that the $225,000 Bentley he was known for driving, it wasn't his. He had a friend co-sign or underwrite it, and Reginald was known for skipping car payments. He was also behind in his child support, and in June of 2007, he told a judge he was unemployed and indigent. But in September, when Nyla challenged him, he was going on about how very wealthy he was, that he partied at expensive clubs and owned 15 pair of Gucci shoes. In case you're wondering, Gucci shoes run over $600 for the most basic pair. Reginald did what it took to look successful and wealthy on the outside, but it was just a thin veneer. And this is where police believe the motive for the murder is found. Not that Reginald was a spurned lover or that he was angry that Nyla was talking bad about him. It's that she scratched the surface and exposed the real Reginald, the one he was hiding from everyone. He couldn't stand it. He thought he could get back some control with the threats about the sex tape, but Nyla took that power away. She didn't back down. She doubled down. She reminded him that he stole the tape and that she would report it to police. Revenge porn was not yet a crime in 2007, but theft, that's a crime. When Reginald was arrested for Nyla's murder in early December 2007, police knew where to find him. He was in the Cook County Jail. He'd been arrested in October for threatening a gas station attendant. Then he pled guilty for violating an order of protection and was given 100 days in lockup. 
Then he was charged with punching a sheriff's deputy in the face. That's right. Three arrests in less than three months since Nyla's death. Reginald Potts is falling apart. After his arrest for murder, Reginald spoke to police. He denied being in Nyla's apartment or building on the 18th. The police said people saw his Bentley. He still denied it and said he was being framed. Then they asked him if he understood what CCTV footage was and that they saw him arrive and leave with Nyla. Reginald said the only way he was on that footage is if they got creative with Photoshop. Then there was a bunch of drama over him standing for a lineup. He ended up taking his clothes off in the interrogation room and refused to participate. Reginald was now charged with first-degree murder and the state was seeking the death penalty. So, Reginald demanded his right to a speedy trial. And then, he did everything in his power to delay that trial. And here's the thing with timelines on trials. The state has to abide by the timeline to ensure the defendant's rights are protected. If delays are caused by the defendant, they do not count against the state in any way. Reginald was able to continue to delay proceedings by going back and forth about defending himself. So he was appointed lawyers, then he fired them so he could go pro se. Then he wanted the public defenders back, and then he changed his mind again. The judge was very patient with this. He was willing to hear Reginald out on his complaints about things he felt his attorneys had missed, and that he was going to proceed to defend himself. But then the judge's patience ran out. He appointed attorneys to Reginald and said the trial was going forward. The trial of Reginald Potts and the murder of Nyla Franklin took place eight years after Nyla's death. You heard that right. He dragged it out for eight years, and he was locked up in the Cook County Jail that entire time. One thing this stalling did accomplish is that it was no longer a death penalty case. Somewhere around the fourth year of delays... Illinois abolished capital punishment, so now Reginald is facing life without parole. The trial began in late October 2015. Nyla's father passed away a year before the trial started, and his family said that his grief over the loss of his child contributed to his demise. The state's theory of the crime was that Reginald had somehow gotten Nyla's guard down enough that she left her apartment with him. In the parking garage, he strangled her, then he put her body in the trunk of her car. He drove south to Calumet City and Hammond, where he disposed of evidence and Nyla's body. Then he kept up the ruse that Nyla was still alive by texting friends, making a dinner reservation, and even calling Brent. Then, when he was back in Chicago, he called 911 from her phone to make it look like she never left the city and make it look like she was attacked after 10 o'clock at night. He met up with his various girlfriends, making it seem that he couldn't possibly have done anything, because, wow, he's got an alibi. The evidence they used included security footage to prove that Reginald was the last person to see Nyla alive. Friends testified they saw the emails and heard the voicemail where he threatened to have her erased. They even learned that the video store where Nyla's body was found was owned by Reginald's brother-in-law. But the smoking gun... The smoking gun was the cell phone data. It showed that Reginald's phone and Nyla's phone traveled together to where her items were found, where her body was found, where her car was found, and then went back to Chicago. The defense decided what they had to work with was the lack of evidence. Everything in the case was circumstantial, so they tried to encourage what we call the CSI effect. That the forensic heavy crime dramas on TV influenced jurors to expect that type of hard evidence in order to convict. The National Institute of Justice admits this is more of an anecdotally based belief of law enforcement and prosecutors rather than an actual documented phenomenon. But it's what Reginald had available. His defense team pointed out that there was no DNA, no fingerprints, or witnesses that connected Reginald to the murder. In fact, the medical examiner couldn't even conclusively say how Nyla was killed. They also said the prosecutors didn't know where or when Nyla died, and I have to agree with them. Reginald strangling Nyla in the parking garage in broad daylight seems a little shaky. But do prosecutors have to prove every element of every crime to win a conviction? No, they don't. The other thing the defense pointed out was that cell tower location is a flawed process. And we know that. A phone can be sent to a tower that's further away. 
and they may have gotten somewhere with this argument if these two cell phones pinged in one place together. But they followed each other to multiple points, and it's hard to believe that the data was that seriously flawed that it was wrong for the entire trip. There was one part of the cell phone evidence that the defense wanted the jury to accept, and that was the 7.30 call to Brent. The state's theory was that Nyla was already dead at this point, but Brent said he heard a voice that he thought was Nyla's. So the state focused on the call being staticky, short and hard for Brent to understand. Under those conditions, maybe it was just a man imitating a woman's voice. At the end of the trial, the jury took just two hours and 15 minutes to find Reginald guilty. His sentencing phase began in March of 2016 and lasted five days, which is a long time to hear witnesses for a sentencing. On the first day, Reginald, now 38, refused to participate, saying he didn't want the media in there because they were sensationalizing things. When he learned the hearing would continue without him and he would not be able to assist his attorneys, he changed his mind. Though the bulk of Reginald's criminal history was not admissible during the jury trial, it was allowed in at sentencing. And it painted Reginald as a con man, someone who talked his way through life. But when his back was against the wall, he became violent. They had around 35 witnesses to testify to this, as well as the victim impact statements. Reginald spoke for 40 minutes on his own behalf, and during that time, some of Nyla's family left the courtroom. They didn't want to hear what he was saying. Reginald continued to deny his guilt. He seemed to think the alleged motive was that Nyla broke things off with him. So he addressed that, saying he broke up with her. But it's like he's missing something. She didn't just break things off with him. She exposed his lies. That was the root of his anger. That's why he killed Nyla. But he insisted in his statement that he broke up with her. It was important to him that everyone know that. Reginald also asked the judge to consider his three daughters and give him something less than life in prison. He said he couldn't apologize for something he couldn't do. And the judge didn't buy it. And let me make sure I get this quote right, because it's a good one. The judge called Reginald a cold, calculating, conniving coward of a con man and gave him life with no possibility of parole. Referring to the threatening voicemail Reginald left for Nyla, the judge said, You didn't erase her, Mr. Potts. She lives on in the hearts and minds of those people who cherished her while she was alive. This week's episode was written by Charlie Worrell of the Crime Lines podcast. If you love a good story, please check out Crime Lines. Charlie does a fantastic job, and she's one of my good podcasting friends. Editing this week was provided by Bill Burt, and Olivia Holmesley is our production assistant. I'm Nina Instead, the producer and voice behind the Already Gone podcast. I appreciate you listening, and please be safe.